Welcome to the EPG Patachala, the course for PG program in computer science series and this is the compiler designs 19th module. The objective of this module is uh, to learn to use the parser generator. Uh, as a parser generator, we are trying to use uh, the YAC, a tool for uh, understanding and uh, how to implement the parser using the YAC tool. Uh, after discussing on a brief uh, note on the YAC tool, the next phase of the compiler is also going to be uh, introduced in this uh, module, which is the semantic phase of the compiler. So, the um, keywords parser generator, YAC parser and semantic uh, phase. So, parser generator. So, earlier we have actually uh, looked upon the different types of parsers, namely the LL parser, the LR parser and even in the LR parser we have looked at uh, the simple LR, the canonical LR and the LALR parsers. And uh, parsers basically is used to validate the syntax of a particular programming construct. So, we already know that we are going to use uh, context free grammar to uh, write the uh, programming constructs and then using that context free grammar which we already know, we are going to construct a parsing table. Now, both the top down parsers and the bottom up parsers basically uses and constructs a parsing table and when an input comes into picture, it tries to uh, check this against the parsing table and then checks whether the string is going to be correct or incorrect. Now, um, if you start uh, building this parser from scratch, it is going to be actually a time consuming job and uh, since uh, the there is a difference in the syntax of the programming language from one programming language to another programming language, uh, we need not start from scratch uh, the parser for every programming language. So, therefore, what we know normally do is we try to use make use of an available tool and uh, we already know that there is enough integration between the lexer and the parser. Uh, the lexer is going to give a token to the parser whenever the parser is going to ask for a token. Okay. So, we already know that uh, in one of the modules we have discussed that the lexer uh, that is the scanning phase uh, which is nothing but the tokenization has been implemented using the tool lex. So, we are going to extend th this and then check whether um, we can come up with a tool or we can use an existing tool which is going to be for a parser. Okay. So, uh, the parser could also be done with the tool so that uh, it is going to speed up the process of parsing the tokens and then checking whether the syntax of a particular uh, programming construct is going to be correct or incorrect. Now, uh, some parsers which are available are the ANTLR parser, YAC parser and Bison parser. ANTLR um, tool and LR basically, okay. it is a tool uh, that generates LL of K parsers. Okay. Uh, LL of K we, as we already know it is um, the top down parser which is going to be a non recursive parser. Uh, the other parser is uh, the YAC which is uh, an acronym for yet another compiler compiler which generates LALR of one parsers. Again we know that this K here and this one here uh, indicates how many input symbols are going to be considered at a particular point of time. The next one is a Bison parser which is nothing but the YAC parser but a faster version of the YAC parser. Now these three parsers are available and the one that uh, comes with the Unix utility is your uh, YAC parser. Uh, so, um, what we are trying to do is, uh, we are trying to check whether um, the how to define um, I mean a programming construct using the YAC parser. Again the YAC is uh, nothing but a rule based programming language similar to LEX. Okay. So, and we already know that bottom up parsers are preferred. Uh, so, YAC is preferred and it is a used tool for implementing the parser uh, action of a particular which is the second phase of the compiler. Now, um, this is going to be the um, LALR1 parser with YAC or Bison. The input will be a, a YAC specification which is going to be a dot .y file. Now, as you could uh, correlate, uh, the lex uh, file is a dot .l file. Similarly, here the YAC is nothing but uh, YAC specification is nothing but a YAC dot .y file. So, user basically gives a dot .y file as the input. And the YAC or Bison compiler is basically used which is going to convert this input to what is called as a y.tab.c. So, this is again compared to lex.yy.c of a particular lex compiler which is going to convert an input .l file to lex.yy.c. Similarly here, this y.tab.c again I have now a C program as my output here that is fed to a C compiler which is going to convert into a executable and so once I run an a.out. I will be in a position to execute my input YAC file and uh, check whether this token is going to be correct or incorrect. Okay. So, this is again uh, similar to the LEX program. 
So, where it is going to uh, consider three sections, the first one is YAG declarations and C declarations. Okay, so, YAG declarations are uh, we already know that uh, the variable declarations uh, and then uh, the acronym declaration. Uh, and then uh, what we mean by that the context free grammar declarations all these can happen at this particular uh, section of the YAC file and again this percentage percentage is going to be a delimiter okay that is going to separate one section from the next section. So, the next section consists of translation rules. Now, this translation rules is again similar to the translation rules defined by a lex file which is going to consist of two parts as we can see. And then you have the user defined auxiliary procedures here which is going to contain also the uh, main function of a particular of a C program ok. So, the translation rules are typically grammar productions and actions. So, this grammar production we can declare it in the YAG declaration and then a precise and a concise representation could be shown in productions. So, here production 1 correspond to one grammar uh, production, one uh, production corresponding to a particular grammar and what semantic action are you trying to expect it to happen. So, that is what is available in this particular section. So, similar to how we had a regular expression here corresponding action was specified in the uh, second component of the translation rules. Similarly, for a YAG program also we will have a production 1 here and then we will correspondingly there will be a semantic action 1, 2, 3 etcetera ok. So, the YAG program which is similar to the LEX specification will also have three parts the declarations part, the translation rules and the uh, user defined auxiliary procedure. So, this is where the uh, variable initialization declaration of variables that is used by the YAG program and by the main will basically be available and on top of it you will also have a uh, the uh, token specification that is the regular expression corresponding to tokens all these could be available in the YAG declarations itself ok. So, writing a grammar in YAC, uh, so the context free grammar which we normally adopt can also be used, uh, can be used for the YAC specification also. Now, uh, where the productions in YAC are of the form, uh, we already know that non-terminal produces a combination of terminals and non-terminals is what we normally have. So, here how do I specify is the LHS is typically a non-terminal again, there is a colon instead of your arrow. Uh, and uh, you will have here tokens or non-terminals and followed by actions and then you will have or that is is it going to be this tokens followed by the corresponding action or is it going to be this tokens followed by the corresponding action and that I can keep on cascading uh, as many productions as I want and the corresponding action that has been taken, uh, taken care of by in a cascading fashion using the or operator which is finally terminated with the semicolon. So, this is the syntax for writing the grammar in the YAC uh, program ok. So, um, tokens that are single characters can be used directly within productions example a plus. So, you can simply have a plus directly there itself. Named tokens must be declared first in the declaration part using percentage token and then token name. For example, here um, if I say uh, open parenthesis, so I can have the token as open parenthesis here and then I can say here OP which is nothing but an open parenthesis or if I say plus here it is a token I can have here addition operator ok. So, which can be used in subsequent sections. So, this is just a convenience of representing your grammar in a different format where I will put it as a token. So, for example, if I have a um, expression, so expression can be either a Boolean expression or it could be an arithmetic expression. So, I can have here plus indicates what? So, plus means addition operator. I can say that or, or indicates a, um, a logical or or a Boolean or, I can just put that here in place ok. So, semantic actions may also refer to that is the action portion may also refer to values of the synthesized attributes of terminals and non-terminals in a production. Now, here uh, we will talk about synthesized attributes in the subsequent section in the subsequent module here. So, where I can also have uh, x uh, produces x is an LHS non-terminal that will produce basically y1, y2 etcetera up to yn and the corresponding action is also basically mapped here. I can use uh, double dollar ok which refers to the value of the attribute x ok. I can also refer dollar followed by i which refers to the value of the attribute of y i. So, this can also be added uh, along with your uh, uh, semantic actions which is the action section of your particular production. For example, here I can say e produces e plus t. So, I can say e here colon I can have capital E plus and then t and I can say here dollar 
dollar um, is equal to dollar 1 plus dollar 3 which means that I am going to actually add 1 and 3 which are variables and then that is going to be put into x. So, I can basically do that also as my scenario. So, I can um, use this uh, where I can also specify values to the uh, in the action setting that has to basically be carry for, carried out. So, for example, here factor is uh, expression which is nothing but dollar dollar is equal to dollar 2 meaning that factor is your LHS non-terminal here that corresponds to the RHS EXPR that is within a para within parenthesis okay and dollar dollar is equal to dollar 2 meaning that dollar correspond to the LHS factor and dollar 2 correspond to expression. So, I am assigning actually a constant 2 to the uh, variable um, factor okay. So, this is how basically do and we also know that uh, the um, uh, Lex program supported YY uh, text it also supported yy len and so many yy functions. Similarly, here uh, the yak program also supports a variety of yy commands the first one is being yy parse. So, yy parse which is going to be called once from a main that is this is definitely going to be available as part of a main function which is in the auxiliary section ok. So, you will repeat it this again repeatedly calls yy lex until it is done. So, you keep on calling yylx to get the next uh, uh, text and so on and so forth and so th uh, that will also be used. So, yylx is also going to be called and on syntax error you uh, this will be the, the yy parse typically calls the yy error. So, yy parse keeps calling yylx ok until your input is done and in case of an error it is going to be called yy error which is written by the user. So, the user has to write what error message this uh, program has to print in case of encountering an incorrect token. So, and this function the yy parse basically returns 0 that is you have a return statement here return yy parse. So, depending upon that return yy parse will return a 0 or a 1 depending upon if the input is going to be successfully parsed or it is going to be throwing up an syntax error. So, yy parse is a definite function call in as part of the auxiliary procedure of your um, YAC program. One more some more definitions. So, information about tokens. So, token names. So, the tokens are declared using the percentage symbol. A single percentage is basically used to uh, indicate the token name. Double percentage separates one section from the other as we have already seen. So, percentage token token name is what we have said seen as a syntax. So, percentage token here percentage open parenthesis that can basically say open parenthesis and close parenthesis and so on and so forth. So, a single character tokens do not have to be declared. So, if you are going to have only one character, any name not declared as token is assumed to be a non terminal, ok. So, this is one more convention here, and the start symbol of a grammar is defined using the percentage start, of course, it is optional. And uh, the operator info you have to give the precedence and associativity of operators, and the stuff to be copied verbatim into the output, example declarations, etc., is enclosed within a pair of percentage. So, whatever you give within the pair of percent uh, parenthesis that is going to be copied exactly to your uh, input ok. So, some examples of yak rule. So, the grammar production is something like this I am going to have a colon here or something it also permits a arrow. So, this is going to be your syntax. So, rule RHS can have an arbitrary code uh, arbitrary C code embedded within parenthesis. Uh, so, here is a colon b 1 print f after b 1 x is equal to 0 x b 2 x plus plus semicolon b 3 etcetera. So, what happens here when I see a b 1 I have to do this and then followed by b 2 and then I have to increment x plus plus followed by b 3 I am going to do what ok. So, what does basically mean is once it encounters the first symbol it is going to initialize x to 0 and then once it encounters the next symbol b 2 it is going to increment x by 1 and then subsequently whatever action you specify will also be available here. And uh, here left recursion is basically more efficient than a right recursion. So, here a colon a x and if you could remember this is a yak parser. So, left recursion elimination is not basically done here you process the grammar as it is ok. So, here the yak parsers um, the left recursive grammar is more efficient than a right recursive grammar. And in the event of parsing we already know what is going to be a conflict. Conflict is when multiple actions are going to be available to carry out a particular task ok. So, the typical uh, conflicts are a shift reduce conflict or a reduce reduce conflict that is will I shift into the stack and or will I reduce it by a production. 
So, in the case of a shifted use conflict, the conflict is resolved using a shift action, a default shift action and in the event of a reduce reduce uh, conflict, the uh, default uh, situation is reduced with the first rule which is going to be listed. Okay? So, that is how YAC basically resolves the um, conflict. And uh, here uh, in another way of removing conflicts is for example, if you have multiple operators, so you uh, use the operator precedence for resolving conflict as well as you also you supposing same uh, precedence of operators comes into picture, you use associativity to resolve the conflict or you can also restructure the grammar so that um, you can uh, rewrite it and avoid uh, make the grammar as unambiguous so that it can basically be parsed with the yak parser. Uh, you also you can use a y dot output to identify reasons for the conflict and then rather later analyze that and then try to resolve it in one or any of the uh, specified many ways. For example, here um, operators in the same group, group will have the same precedence. For example, plus and minus, so percentage left. So, this is going to be um, percentage left associative, right associative and non-associative, you can have declarations here. And so, plus and minus can have the same precedence, star and uh, division can have the same precedence and uh, this is going to be right associative compared to the other ones. So, that can also be uh, specified. And uh, precedence is also unary operators, you can have to specify precedence. So, that is also one may, way of, uh, you can change the precedence of a rule to be uh, that of a token being specified. So, you can also use that for specifying operator properties. And uh, in addition to that, you can also say that you will go from a top to bottom fashion rather than a bottom to top uh, fashion for uh, resolving your uh, precedence of operators. Now, there is a token called as error. Uh, and uh, there is a yy command also yy error which can be used for handling errors. So, the token error is reserved for error handling, it can be used in rules, it also suggests places where errors might be detected and recovery can be uh, possible. So, for example, if you consider uh, uh, this uh, statement, uh, if uh, statement can be if expression statement or if error statement. Okay, so, you can add along with the grammar itself, is it going to be obeying this particular combination or is it going to be obeying this particular combination. If it is going to be done using this, we can definitely know it is going to be a error uh, situation rather than an actual expression scenario. So, you can handle, you can add grammatic, I mean productions to the grammar rule itself so that you can basically handle the errors in a better fashion. So, uh, how does the parser typically handles error? We have already seen that in the uh, parsing action itself, the YAC also does it in a similar fashion. That is, it is going to be having in a panic mode or a phrase mode. So, panic mode basically it keeps on popping till it is going to be finding a legal possible combination. And phrase mode is trying to add new grammatical rules, trying to add error productions, all those things are typically possible with any particular design of a parser. YAC also does the same thing. When an error occurs, the parser pops its stack until it enters a state where the token error is legal. That is, it is going to try to find a combination of the stack along with the input symbol and then tries to find a correct match. So, it is going to keep on popping the symbol from the stack. That is one way. An alternate way would be uh, then behaves as if it saw the token error. Okay? So, if it is going to be a com error combination which is already known to it, it performs the action encountered and resets the look ahead token to the token that caused the error. If no error rules are specified, the processing basically halts. That is, if it is not able to come up with the error, come up with the scenario that is going to detect the error, it is going to come to a halting state. So, uh, how do I control the error behavior? So, the parser can remain in the error state until three tokens are correctly read and shifted into the stack. So, in that case, it can prevent, uh, prevent cascaded error messages are prevented. If an error is detected while parser is in error state, no error message is given and the input token causing the error is going to be deleted. So, this is again one more uh, thing and as I said al already why error ok. To force the parser to believe that an error has been fully recovered from you can use the why why error ok uh, function uh, and to clear the token that caused the error you can also have why why clear in that can also be used. Why why error is also used for printing out an error to the user saying that uh, you have encountered an error. So, these are some of the yy commands which can basically be incorporated along with the um, input so that you can basically uh, recover from error. Again, the parser only recovers from error, it does not correct your input errors. So, where do you place the error tokens? This yy error in or the yy error function call, where will I place all these uh, error functions or where, when will I initiate an error function? 
So typically speaking as a thumb rule, we can place the error uh, token that is or the error function call uh, close to the start symbol of the grammar so, so that it can allow uh, recovery without discarding all the inputs basically. Or I can also put it near the terminal symbols to help permit a small amount of input to be discarded due to an error. Tokens like close parenthesis, semicolon that follows non-terminals can also be positions where you can put your error tokens. So at the end of the grammar production or at the end of a particular programming construct or uh, at the end of the terminal symbols that is where the string is going to basically be getting over. Okay, Those are some possible places of placing an error token and uh, you have to place the error token such that it is not going to introduce conflict so that uh, your errors are getting processed in a correct fashion. So some error messages which can basically you be used is the yy error function permits an error message to be printed. So this uh, there is an argument called as char star s which is a pointer to an error message. So I can uh, uh, pass it as an argument for the yy error function and uh, this message is going to be user supplied which is going to print out the error message. More informative error messages can also be printed using the uh, yy character token uh, so that the number of token causing the error can also be listed upon. So you have uh, multiple yy commands that is going to keep track of uh, printing the error messages to the user as well as trying to incorporate error messages along with the yak program itself so that the user can be prompted for any error that is being encountered. Now conflicts uh, we have already seen the shift reduce conflict and the reduce reduce conflict. The par, uh, conflict occurs when the parser has multiple possible actions which we have already seen that. The parser can either keep reading more of the input or it can mimic a derivation step using the input it has already it has read already. So this is how the shift reduce conflict is basically resolved. We have already said that the shift reduce conflict is resolved with reference to the shift and the reduce reduce conflict is resolved with respect to the first reduce action which is being listed. So this is how it basically resolves. It mimics or it pretends as though something is already happening correctly and then it is trying to uh, put it in, uh, into the stack so that it can get the next symbol which is going to be read. Okay. So again here it is trying to mimic a derivation step at that particular point so that it can basically do that. So I, one more uh, approach is you can use the uh, yak uh, underscore v to generate the file y dot output. We have already seen that and this y dot output is typically looked upon to find the parser states with conflicts along with the line numbers and tokens etc. And for each state examine the items to figure out why the conflict is occurring and you can transform the grammar to eliminate the conflict. So this can basically be done. Now this is what happens with reference to handling conflicts where the reason for conflict is basically looked upon ambiguity the operators in expressions. If you have this as a conflict then you have to look at the associativity and precedence of operators. So that can basically be looked upon and uh, we can uh, rewrite the grammar to handle the associativity and precedence of operators so that conflict can basically be avoided. And the next one is error action. You can remove or eliminate the offending error action. That is if your error action is going to be placed at inappropriate places, you can basically look at it and remove it. Then the third one is semantic action where you can remove the offending semantic action and then try to replace with a, another uh, a possible uh, construct. Uh, supposing if I, if I do not have sufficient look ahead, so you have to expand the non-terminant involved to generate more look ahead tokens so that it can basically be uh, done. Supposing if it is going to be any other uh, then we have to uh, leave it to the uh, parser to just recover so that we can rewrite the uh, rules itself so that it can handle conflicts in a better fashion. So we can also integrate the Lex program uh, along with the Yak program. So where the Lex will have specifications like uh, that corresponds to a regular expression and those regular expressions can basically be used in the uh, declarations part of the yak which will be used to write the context free grammar rules in the subsequent yaks uh, program. So how does that handle is you can basically look at um, the yak compiler to get a yak.y file which is going to generate a output a y.tab.c and a y.tab.h file. Similarly, I can use a lex compiler to generate a lex.l and uh, the output will be lex.yy.c. Now I can int, uh, give all these three as an input to a C compiler which is going to take a y.tab.h, a lex.yy.c and a y.tab.c 
which is run by a C compiler to generate on A.out. So, how does this basically work is your lex file, okay, your lex file will basically have the declarations. Of course, multiple main will not be possible. So, you will not have a main function in the lex declarations. You will simply have uh, um, the first and the second part. There will be a uh, percent, double percentage to indicate end of part 2. The main program will be available in the um, yak uh, file, y, dot y file and uh, you will make it run through a yak compiler and a lex compiler sequentially. This will generate these three as an output that can basic okay you can in fact include uh, y dot tab dot h as an include include uh, as an include file in the lex program also and that is going to basically be run through a c compiler to generate a a dot out okay so this is also possible so where you will have uh, the lex tool uh, lex or flex with yak or bison that is lexus with yak and flexus with bison as we already know flex is fast lex compiler okay so that can also be possible so with that uh, the features of the yak and the need for uh, uh, yak to perform parsing is basically discussed so far. Now, um, with this in mind, so we will uh, be in a position to uh, look at uh, the next phase of the compiler, which is uh, nothing but uh, the semantic phase of the compiler. So, so far what we have done is we have looked at the yak program, we have basically combined the yak with the lex also and then we have written rules corresponding to the leg specification and the yak specification and then based on that we have tried to um, create the output files lex.yy.c and uh, yak uh, y.tab.c uh, and we have also seen combining these three together into a C compiler to generate a a.output output file. So, uh, and then that is run through a C compiler. So, if you run this executable a dot out, you will be in a position to look at what is going to be the output of a particular sequence of program. So, this completes the second phase of the compiler which is nothing but uh, the syntax phase. The syntactic phase and the uh, lexical phase combines and works together to generate the, to validate the syntactic constructs of particular programming language. Once this is done, the next is going to be incorporating the semantic phase of the compiler. So, uh, that will be discussed in the next module. Thank you.